question I want to just make you aware very quickly. Um, my table is in the back and there's a number of resources. I want to encourage you to take advantage of the opportunities to avail yourself of. There's uh, access to the kingdom, the C CD sets. There's a church management series. And uh, all of my books are back there. One of them in particular I want to draw your attention to. It's understanding the process of purpose. Uh, you can know your purpose, be loaded with potential, but never fulfill your purpose because you don't understand the process of God that gets you from your potential to your purpose. And so I want to encourage you to get a copy of this. I'll be over there at the end of the session during the break. I'll be happy to autograph them for you and to also talk with you. Amen? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise. We thank you for your word. Your word is truth. We've come to be changed. Continue to change us. We open ourselves to you to receive from you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The kingdom and social change. As we deal with this session, you're going to begin to understand perhaps clearer than ever why Jesus was so effective. Why, in fact, people love to be around him because of the social change that he brought with his actions and his words. So, you may not uh, have opportunity to write everything, but the good news is you can get a copy of the DVD, okay? Because I may go a little fast. All right, due to the present state of the world, social change is a necessity. It's not an option. Um, I think God has kind of allowed the world to get into a state where we as kingdom citizens are going to have to be involved in social change. Here's a brief idea of what we're faced with in the world. We live in a world full of spiritual oppression. Religion is a mess. It has never helped anyone. It never has. We live in a world of spiritual oppression. Civic disintegration. Moral confusion. I think you'll agree with that. I'm describing the world you live in. Social decay and intellectual darkness. The Bible has some very interesting passages in it. One of those passages has to do with being wise in your own eyes. Uh, in the world today, we have a lot of people who believe they are wise, but they are wise in their own eyes. In other words, they're the only person who thinks they're smart. No one else does. Yet they think they're smart. Very interesting. But let's hear the words of Jesus and begin to get an understanding of why he was so impactful on earth. Matthew 12, 18. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim what? What shall he proclaim? Justice. Justice to the Gentiles. Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tie mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Jesus was impactful because he brought to the environment that he came into social change. Luke 4 and 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Here's what he says now. This is Jesus talking. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to do what? Proclaim release to the captives there's a lot of captives in our nations today there are a lot of captives he's come to proclaim what release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are what downtrodden those who are downtrodden you see I think sometimes we miss 
the social change that Jesus brought in the environment that he came into. One of the reasons he had so many problems was because of the social change that he brought. He questioned the systems as he meant them and he would not allow them to stay the same. Our mandate as kingdom citizens is clear. We are referred to as what? Salt, first of all. You are the salt of the earth. Salt has a way of changing, everybody say change. Whatever salt lands on cannot stay the same. Would you agree with me? I don't care if it's meat. I don't care if it's a piece of metal. Hello. Whatever salt lands on cannot remain the same. And what I love about salt is this. The change may not be instantaneous necessarily. <laughs> but if that salt remains there, it is only a matter of time. You see, as kingdom citizens, our mandate is clear. We have come to bring change. Yes, Secondly, we are what? Light. When light comes in, nothing remains the same. And you can take that two ways. Literal light, or you can take it from the perspective of knowledge. In the Bible, darkness usually donates darkness. So whenever light comes, knowledge comes, you're changed. And you can't remain the same. You start asking questions. You start asking, why is this the way it is? Why has this remained this way? Why? Because you've got some knowledge all of a sudden. If you didn't have the knowledge, you would just accept what was. Knowledge is, ser is a serious thing. It's called light. Jesus brought a whole lot of light. That's why he brought a lot of change. And that's why they had problems with him. Because he always as we would say, rocked the boat. No, I think he turned the boat over many times. <laughs> he didn't just rock the boat. But that's because he was bringing knowledge, light to people. He questioned the systems. And then we refer to, in our mandate as kingdom citizens, as what? Yeast. When yeast gets in a piece of dough, the dough has to change. I didn't say it wants to change, it has to change. When kingdom citizens understand who they really are and who they represent, then change takes place. Something ought to happen if you know who you are and you understand your mandate. This is your mandate. You are salt, you are light, and you are yeast. All right. Say it with me. Salt, light, and yeast. So tell your neighbor, hello, salty. <laughs> All right. The reintroduction of the kingdom of God by Jesus has always directly impacted society and caused social change. The kingdom of God has a liberating and empowering nature. So you see, it was not by chance that Jesus decided to encounter the woman at the well. It was not by chance. It had to do with social change. The woman didn't even realize what was going on at the time. In fact, she was so ingrained in the system, she had bought the system so well that she was kind of frightened, if you will, that he would be there and talk to her. A 
Samaritan woman. Two strikes against her. Samaritan, first of all, second class citizen, and then a woman, second, second class citizen. And she herself was shocked that Jesus would talk to her. It was not by chance. Jesus always caused social change. So he would never, he would, he would never ever be accepted by the religious order of the day. Never, ever. Because he's changing things. What are you doing talking to the Samaritan woman? That's not what we do. You are turning the boat over. <laughs> not just rocking it. You're turning it over. Very interesting. Those who ruled and maintained their position. Those who ruled and maintained their position by subjugation of others and religious leaders who favored ritual instead of a relationship with God were confronted and impacted by Jesus' actions and his words. Not just his words, but his actions as well. They were immediately impacted. Social change was a necessity in the environment that Jesus came into. There was no way he could come in that environment and not cause social change. I submit to you today, the world is in such a mess that there is no way we can exist in this environment and not cause social change. There's no way around it. The kingdom message questioned the societal environment of poverty, injustice, and religious slavery. I want to read it again. The kingdom message questioned the societal environment of poverty, injustice, and religious slavery. What was interesting in that environment that Jesus came into was that the religious leaders were part of the problem. They were part of the problem. Remember Jesus doing something interesting when he went into the temple and cleared the temple of the money changers? Well, the money changers were there because the religious leaders allowed them to be there. Hello. If the religious leaders had not allowed them to be there, they couldn't be there. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them was getting a little cut on the side. But here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. He clears the temple. <laughs> and he didn't ask them nicely to go. He assisted them in going. <laughs> That's how serious he was about social change. Understanding justice and righteousness is germane to affecting social change. These concepts were the foundation of Jesus' thinking and influenced his teaching and his actions. His quote of the Hebrew indicated his knowledge of the meaning of justice and righteousness. He talked about it all the time. And I want to examine these two words. There are two words that are used in the Hebrew for justice. Very interesting words. Very interesting. The first word, mispat. Usually translated as justice. The restoration, watch this now, watch what it means. The restoration of fair, equitable, and harmonious relationship in society. So when Jesus talked about justice, this is what the people heard. See, we just read it in our English and we just see justice. That's not what they heard. This is what they heard when Jesus referred to justice. 
And immediately when you hear this, if this is what you heard, you now have to stop and question your actions. Am I lining up with, with, with the restoration of life? But you know, I can really appreciate why the religious leaders had a problem with Jesus. Just, just look at the first part of the meaning of this word. Restoration of fair, equitable, and harmonious relationship in society. They were in the business of causing problems in relationships. Jesus came with the business of mending relationships. Any member of the community has the same rights as any other. This is what the people heard. We just read and we see justice. We don't have the full understanding of this thing. This is what the people heard when Jesus started talking about justice. That we read earlier, the scriptures we looked at. This is what they heard. Any member of the community, any member of the community has the same rights as any other. Now, of course, you know they fell down uh, very, very badly in regards to how they treated their women. Women were not treated this way. They were treated as second-class citizens. And that's why Jesus made a point to meet the Samaritan woman. It's not by chance. It's not by accident. It's by design. He knew exactly what he was doing. And that's why he acknowledged that woman with the issue of blood who pushed through the crowd. No doubt pushed through a lot of men. Something that was taboo. Lady, 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 lady. You're out of place. But Jesus acknowledged her. It's not by mistake. It's by design. He was trying to bring some social change. Everybody say change. This is serious. This is a serious. This is a serious understanding here. Any member has the same rights as any other. Wow. Everyone has the same inalienable right to abundance. This is what the people heard. This is what the people heard. Now, can you imagine Jesus making that statement? And those who are profiteering at the expense of those who do not have. Now they got a problem with Jesus. Who is this man? Where is he coming from? He's upsetting things. He's upsetting things. And sad to say, religious leaders were part of that. Ah, <laughs> oh boy. Everyone has the same inalienable right to abundance and wholeness and freedom from oppression. This is what the people heard when Jesus talked about justice. Wow. Let's look at the second Hebrew word. Very interesting. Sadiqah. Usually translated as righteousness. Its focus is on behavior that fulfills the responsibilities of relationship, whether with God or with other persons. Now that last part is very, very important. That last piece there. Behavior that fulfills the responsibilities, responsibilities of relationship, whether it is with God or with other people. See, we love to make sure we fulfill our responsibilities relationship-wise with God, but we're not too concerned as to whether we fulfill it with other people. Yeah? That's really not justice. That's not justice. When people, it means when people fulfill their relationship with God through obedience and observance of biblical ordinances and with humanity too, they are considered at that point righteous or in right standing. So in other words, if you have a society where people are just concerned about being in right standing with God, 
but they're not concerned about right standing with their brothers. In other words, they're prepared to treat their brothers and sisters in any manner and think that it's okay. It's not okay. That's not justice. Jesus came to bring change. Now you see the problem. Look at what he's saying. So when he said justice, this is what the people heard. And they had to walk away thinking, this guy is something else. Why don't he be quiet? He's going to upset things. We had this thing all down real good, just under control. Who is this guy? Jesus brought social change. The basis for biblical justice then, under this, under this word, the meaning is this. The basis for biblical justice is fulfillment of our responsibilities to and relationships with others as the ultimate fulfillment of our responsibility to God. In other words, can I say it another way? You are your brother's keeper. See? See? That was Cain's problem. He didn't understand this. You are your brother's keeper. So when we see things that are out of order in society as kingdom citizens, we end up following our king. And change is the result. Because we are our brother's keeper. It is significant that both justice and righteousness is based on social relationships and interactions. You cannot have justice apart from right social relationships. Can I say it again? You cannot have justice apart from right social relationships. The two go hand in hand. That's why Jesus brought such social change. These interactions result in social change. In the Hebrew scriptures, very interesting, there's no word for the individual. Did you realize that? Very interesting. There is no word for the individual. There's only the plural term for people or community. I want you to think about that for a minute. That's why Jesus had to address that environment. Because in the mind of God, what he's saying is, you must always be community-minded. You must always be concerned about those around you. You can never take the position, I'm straight, too bad for them. You can never take that position. There's no word for individual. It's always about the community. So, so Jesus had to address things that people hoped he would not address. The last thing they hoped he would do was come along and start talking about the poor and those who were being abused and, and about widows and about, and about women. That, that's the last thing they hoped he would do. Don't do that. But he had to. He had to. Therefore, justice is the divinely ordained way of relating to another in human society. I want to repeat that. Justice is the divinely ordained way of relating to another in human society. There are three basic law codes in the Bible. I want to just list them for you real quick. I'm not going to go into them. We're not going to turn in. We're not going to get into that. Don't worry about it. We don't have time for it. Okay? But I just want to list them for your reference. Okay? There's the covenant. Exodus 20. There's the Deuteronomy Code, Deuteronomy 12. And there's the Holiness Code, Leviticus 17. 
All the law codes promote and legislate social justice and economic parity. Social change is a natural result of these codes. Social change is a natural result of these codes. All right. Protecting widows, often strangers, and the poor from economic exploitation was a distinct focus of these codes. The ten, ten principles I want to give you here of the law codes which should influence our social change. Ten principles that should influence our social change. Number one, forbidding the charging of interest to poor borrowers. Wow. Wow, sound up to date to me. I said, sounds up to date to me. Hello, I said, it sounds up to date to me. Hmm? Especially if you know that the person is poor before you gave them a loan. Something is wrong with that. I said, something's wrong with that. Number two, protection from exploitation. Protection from exploitation by providing fair and just measures of weight. Jesus came into an environment where, of course, they used weights to measure stuff that they would purchase. And, of course, sometimes those who were in charge of the store would put some unjust weights. In other words, they would simply overcharge. Can I say it another way? They would steal. All right? In Bahamian, we'd say they would thief. All right? <laughs> All right? They would steal from people because they would give them unjust weights. They would charge them for what they were not receiving. It's called stealing. Well, that sounds up to date to me. Hello? Huh? Number three. Safeguarding the dignity of debtors by forbidding creditors to accost them at their homes. In other words, there has to be some dignity for the person who made a loan. There has to be some protections. There, there has to be some protocol. You, you shouldn't be allowed to just abuse someone because they got a loan. And, they, and some circumstances occurred maybe that they could not uh, control and they're in default. There has to be a proper protocol. Everybody say change. That needs to change. That needs to change. Something is wrong. Someone got a loan and they've been paying it for years. All of a sudden, they, they come upon a situation that's beyond their control. They're not able to pay it as they would like to. There has to be a protocol that has dignity in it. Can I get amen somewhere? Hmm? There has to be a protocol that, that gives dignity to that person. Number four. Providing the earnings of hired servants by providing that wages be paid on the day they earn. In other words, you know, don't tell them come back two weeks from now and they've worked already. So you can gain some interest off the money you should be paying them. Hello? Hello? But this is the kind of stuff that went on. Can, can I say maybe this is the kind of stuff that's going on? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just asking a question. <laughs> I'm just asking a question. I'm just asking a question. Social change. Jesus came to address these kinds of injustices. And the poor were being taken advantage of. Five. Specifically, forbidding perversions of justice against the poor. 
See, the poor are the most vulnerable because usually they are ignorant of their rights. They're not ignorant now. They're ignorant of their rights. That means they don't know. Ignorance doesn't mean someone is stupid. You realize that. Don't confuse the two. We're all ignorant of something. That is, we don't know. But the poor are at the most risk. And that's why Jesus was so concerned about justice. Because usually they are ignorant of their rights. When someone is ignorant of their rights, they can be taken advantage of very easily. Very easily. All right? Six, prohibiting partiality and bribes in the courts because such actions benefited the rich. Boy, this up to date. This is up to date. Hmm? You have money? They say sometimes you can buy justice. I'm just saying what they say now. I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody. I'm just saying what they say. But these codes back there, from way back there, sought to address these issues. And I don't think too much has changed. I think we're in that same environment today where some people are able to buy justice. Seven, enhancing justice in the courts by increasing both the requirements for valid testimony of witnesses and the penalty for false testimony. Very interesting, these codes, these law codes way back there. Listen, God have this thing figured out. He know exactly what goes on. You think God don't know what's going on? He knows exactly what goes on. <laughs> Very interesting. Eight, for giving the truly needy, notice, notice, I've described the needy there. I didn't say the needy. What did I say before? Truly needy. Not everyone that's needy is truly needy. There's some folks that are truly lazy. They're not truly needy. <laughs> okay? They are truly lazy. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> for giving the truly needy any outstanding balance after seven years. This is an interesting concept that they had in the Old Testament. Very interesting concept. What's, what's, the, what's the idea? You heard about ideas yesterday, right? Okay. What is the idea behind that in God's mind? It seems to me the idea behind that in God's mind is that no one should be held captive for more than seven years as it relates to debt. In other words, if you have not exacted the amount of interest in seven years, you don't need any more. That's what it seems like. The thought in God's mind is, wow, wow, wow. Interesting thought, interesting thought. Number nine, instituting the year of Jubilee. At the end of 50 year cycle, when all Lands were returned to the families of their original owners and all bond servants released. What a thought. What a thought in the mind of God. In other words, there's enough for everybody. You don't need to keep holding on after 50 years. My Lord, let them have the land back. What a thought in God's mind. Now, I'm going to give you 18, in a little while, don't worry, I'm going to give you 18 ways to go about social change. Don't worry. You're going to have your chance at bat. Number 10, 
allowing the poor to bring less expensive sacrifices to the temple. Now, what's the thought behind that? The thought behind that is what I have in brackets. Okay? That's the thought behind that. Equal sacrifices, but not necessarily equal gifts. That's the thought. That's the principle behind it. Could that be? Could that be then? The explanation of what Jesus said one day as he watched this widow put in her few coins. And he said what? This woman has given more than the fellows who came in with their thousands of dollars because she gave out of what she had, all she had. They gave out of their abundance. So it wasn't even a sacrifice what they gave. I think that's the thought behind this equal sacrifice but not necessarily equal gifts and sometimes you know in, in churches pastors make that mistake you know let's say they're fundraising and they just set one bar everyone must bring X amount well everyone may not be able to bring X amount but they may be willing to sacrifice equally with what they can give. Here's the principle. Here's the principle. All right. Now, here's your chance at bat. This is what I want to leave you with. Because this is where you become involved now. Now that you understand Jesus' involvement, now that you understand that social change was a natural part of the kingdom coming, the kingdom could not come in that environment and change not take place. Impossible. Now that you understand that, I want to give you some very practical methods for effecting social change. I want to give you 18 of them. Number one, enter the world of politics. One of the mistakes that we made in the church throughout the years was that we said, don't go into politics. Oh, no, it's dirty. Oh, ooh. So, the folks went into politics who had no morals and no standards. And they made the law for you. Oops. Think about that. Think about it. Huh? Because we wouldn't go. Those who went in had no morals and no standards. And they're the ones who make the laws for you. Then you holler, oh, this law they made. You should have been there. Hello? I say you should have been in there. I told our congregation, part of my responsibility as a pastor is to train and prepare the future leaders of this country. Don't sit back and complain. Oh, look what they're doing. Oh, they're doing. Prepare a new cadre. So number one, it's not by chance I've made it number one. That's on purpose. Because your government is where policies are made that govern your nation. Those policies affect the behavior, the standards of living, the justice system. Every system is affected by those laws. Every system. So that's number one. Number two, ensure just and fair laws are passed. Well, that means you've got to be in position. That means you've got to be in position for that to happen. You can't do that standing outside. You've got to be inside. Three, enter the world of law and expose unjust laws and refuse to encourage lawlessness.
by technicality. Now, I just said a mouthful. I just said a mouthful. If you, as a kingdom citizen, have your standards and your morals intact, then that will dictate, obviously, that there's some cases you can't take. I'm sorry. I'm not about to be a part of the system that encourages lawlessness by helping you get off on a technicality. You know, law is interesting. Let me just say this much. Because someone is found not guilty, it doesn't mean they weren't guilty. It could simply mean they had a smart lawyer who found a technicality that got them off. But they are guilty as the day go by. All right. Four, protect the truly poor by programs and confrontation of those who seek to abuse the poor. That means you've got to be in places of influence. You have got to be in places of influence. You've got to put yourself in places of influence. You've got to be on the boards. Maybe you need to be the mayor. Maybe you need to be the councilwoman. You've got to be in a place of influence. You've got to be the representative. Five. Question unjust taxes. Question them. Question them. That's what Jesus did. You're only following Jesus. He says, look, don't use any unjust weights. Don't rob people. You're only following Jesus. Six. Ensure that the banking systems does not exact more interest than is reasonable. Now, how do you do that? Enter the system and change it from within. That's my first recommendation. I got another one in a minute. Enter the banking system and change it from within. Seven. Create an alternative banking system. Can I hear amen somewhere? Can I get someone to think like this? Create an alternative banking system and challenge the status quo. Who says interest rates have to be at a certain rate? Who says so? Everyone follows everyone else. Hello? I said every bank follows the other bank. Because their thinking is, if these guys can have it at 12%, we can put it at 12%. Well, how about an alternative system that says, you know what? We don't need 12%. 8% is enough profit for us. But see, you've got to be in a position to create an alternative system. Have you ever stopped to think what would happen if you created an alternative system and you begin to charge lower rates? I have a funny feeling that after a while, there'll be those banks who will say, you know what? They're getting all the customers. It's about business. But see, nobody wants to do number seven. That's the problem. Eight. Create an alternative mortgage system and challenge the status quo. Who says the rate has to be at a certain amount? Who said that? Greed said that. I'll tell you who said it. Greed. Greed said it. Challenge that. Nine. Create kingdom-based programs which teach children purpose, potential, and process as an alternative to the life of crime. Yes. That's how you bring social change. That's how you bring change. You can't stand on the outside and complain. We're good at standing on the outside and complaining. We're great at that. 
we are great at that. What we've got to get great at is this, taking action. Taking action. Ten, create principle-centered educational facilities to create the future leaders and preserve the moral fabric of the nation. Anytime you see a leader who has a moral fabric problem, you should stop and ask yourself, hmm, where was that leader prepared? How was that leader prepared? What can I do to make sure we prepare better leaders? See? Something went wrong somewhere. I don't have time to really go into this. But th those are the questions you should stop and ask yourself. Eleven, examine the social systems and expose oppression in all forms. In all forms. Twelve, expose abuse of power and give a voice to the voiceless. Those who don't know what their rights really are. Those who are being abused because of their ignorance, because they don't have the financial wherewithal to hire an attorney. To fight for them. 13. Ask challenging questions in a daily column or through some other media avenue. See, sometimes you just need to ask questions. Just put some questions out there to challenge what's going on. Just some questions. Why is such and such? Why is such and such happening? What is the basis for such and such? You're just asking questions. I mean, you're free to ask questions. I think you have that right. So that you begin to force those who are being unjust to be confronted with their behavior. But if no questions are asked, they feel safe in their injustice behavior, in, in unjust behavior. They feel safe. So, use the media to your advantage and ask some questions. 14. Refuse to submit to or accept the inferior position. In other words, refuse to accept second class status. Just refuse to accept it. Refuse to accept it. 15, find a creative alternative to violence. Jesus was, I think we'll all agree, the most impactful man that ever lived. But he didn't use violence. Interesting, eh? Think about that. No one has ever been more impactful on the planet than Jesus. So find a creative alternative. That's what Martin Luther King did. That's what Mahatma Gandhi did. They found, they found a creative alternative to violence. But it was very impactful. And 16. Speak truth without fear and stand your ground. Now, when you speak truth, just as Jesus experienced, there will be those who have a problem with you speaking truth. Because no one likes the status quo question. If you ever question the status quo, you are going to be labeled a problem. They're not going to say you have a problem. No. They can say you are a problem. <laughs> They're going to say you're a problem. But you've got to, what? Speak it without fear. And stand your ground. Exactly what Jesus did. Exactly what he did. And finally, 17. Don't simply explain an alternative to the problem. Show it. Can you read that one with me? Let's all together. Don't simply explain an alternative to the problem. Show it. Can we read it one more time together? Don't simply explain an alternative to the problem. Show it. Now, why did I ask you to do that? I want that one sink in deep, 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 deep. That sink in deep. I've done my job. I've done my job. We're great at complaining. 
But complaining never got anything done. Don't just point out the problem. Give the solution. Give the solution. And finally, number 18. Qualify yourself. Very, very important. That first word. Qualify yourself. You know, no one really pays attention when someone speaks who is speaking out of ignorance. In other words, they don't know what they are talking about. They're not credible. They're not credible. Okay? So, if the Lord calls you specifically to do some specific things, qualify yourself so that you can be deemed credible to be listened to. So that people don't just brush you off. Oh, that's some fellow in running his mouth. He doesn't know what he's saying, paying no mind. He doesn't even understand what he's talking about. No, very important. Qualify yourself to demand what? Respect. To demand respect. In whatever domain of society you decide to enter to change. And if you qualify yourself, I guarantee you, you will then have the kind of impact that Jesus had. Amen? Thank you very much.